So my name is Wesley Eplin. I'm the policy director at Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. Welcome to the Health and Medicine Forum for Justice and Health Policy, how COVID-19 has affected our healthcare and public health systems. I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Health and Medicine recognizes and acknowledges that we live and work in the land of the Peoria, Miami, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. They continue to carry the stories of their struggles for survival and identity today on these and other lands. As an organization located in Chicago within the state of Illinois, we are obligated to hold these histories and contemporary struggles in our mind today as we talk about community, belonging, and health. I want to give a note of thanks. Thank you to our board and staff committee for the Center for Public Health Equity and Health and Medicine for the collaborative work to bring this forum together. Special thanks to Miriam Siddiqui, Margie Shapps, Shannon Sweetnam, and Leandra Carlisle for their work on bringing today's event together. A few housekeeping notes. So this forum is being recorded and will be available after on Health and Medicine's YouTube channel with, within the next week or so, we'll get it posted. Um, also, a link to the recording will be sent to all registrants of this event. Please place any questions in the Q&A section uh, within Zoom. You can do that as the questions come to you. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, the final section of the forum will we'll start answering these questions. So uh, please, as speakers are speaking, feel free to add those to uh, the Q&A. Also, we have closed captioning enabled for the forum today. You can turn this on by clicking on the CC at the bottom of your Zoom window and selecting either live captioning or the view full transcript option. If you would like to copy the transcript for your own later use, we will plan to close out the forum at about 5.30 PM. So around that time, you might uh, select and copy so that you can retain that if you would like it. So who's in the room today? Um, we'd like you to you know, give a quick hello in the chat. You could share your name, gender pronouns, title, and organization. And we'll, we'll give uh, a minute for folks to do that. Again, please send you, um, please put your name, gender pronouns, title, and organization in the chat for everybody so we can see who's in the room. A little bit about health and medicine. Health and medicine's mission is to promote the health of all Illinoisans by advancing health equity. You can follow us on social media. Um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, we are also on Instagram, so I need to add that to the slide uh, of our future forums. So a little bit um, about today's forum. So it is the first in a series of forums we're planning for 2022. We're planning a nine-part series this year, so we're really excited about that. The next two forums will focus on health workforce challenges and opportunities. I'm sure that's going to come up some today as well, but th those forums will be specifically focused on health workforce challenges. And now for today's speakers and moderators. So I'm really excited for our uh, esteemed panelists today. So first we have Dr. Claudia Fegan, Chief Medical Officer of the Cook County, at Cook County Health. Uh, she is also a board member and immediate past president at Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. We also have Triste Lito Smith, uh, sorry, doc, Dr. Triste Lito Smith, the Chief Strategy Officer at Near North Health. And finally, Dr. Sandy Martel, who's the Public Health Administrator at the Winnebago County Health Department. Moderating today, we have um, Margie Shapps, Executive Director at Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. So I'm going to turn it over to Margie now. Margie, you're, you're muted.
Sorry about that. Sorry about that, everybody. Bad way to start, right? Uh, well, welcome to this forum, everyone. I'm assuming you can all hear me and that you will keep putting your uh, names and identification into the chat. So I hope to have a vibrant conversation today. I know our panelists and I know it will be an, um, a really informative uh, hour and a half and we will get to your questions. So please, we'll get to as many as we can. So please put them into the chat. So let's get started. Um, with nearly a million people dead in our country and over 30,000 of those in Illinois and over two and a half million testing positive in our state since the beginning of the pandemic, and over 25% of all people in hospitals being COVID patients. This has strained our healthcare and public health systems in ways those of us, those of us outside could hardly imagine. Growing disparities in health outcomes between white and non-white populations were exacerbated and continue to be on display in stark relief as the pandemic continues. So from workforce challenges to patient safety to frequently changing national advice and local, the pressures on the health and public health systems have been enormous. What we hope to do with this illustrious panel today is explore those ways in which our systems have been challenged, both the things that they might have expected and those that didn't, and how their respective systems responded to these challenges. We'll explore the ways in which public policy from national to state to county to city actually helped or hindered the work of our provider systems. We'll take a look at what some of the policies and systems changes could and should be made within each of their systems and what we need to see at a government level to better be prepared for this ongoing pandemic and the next emergency. So let me, let me start with a first question to our, all of our panelists. Given that what we know um, given that we know that our public health systems were already strained and underfunded before the pandemic, can you each take a couple of minutes to lay out specific ways your system was hit hardest during the course of this pandemic? And were any of these surprises to you? So why don't we start with Dr. Figa? Thank you, Margie. So um, I think that uh, we shouldn't be surprised that we've been defunding uh, public health for uh, generations for the last, uh, you know, five decades for sure. And um, when COVID first struck uh, the shores of the United States, um, the a reasonable approach would be to uh, do contact tracing and try to identify um, people that had been in contact with someone who had been uh, positive and then isolate those individuals. And we did not have the workforce in place to do that, um, which meant we failed. Um, and we attempted to quickly hire people, train them and begin the contact tracing, but we quickly were overwhelmed by um, the uh, infection itself. It, it spread so rapidly. And it's interesting in that because we should have been able to predict that. You could see that happening in, in other parts of the world. And I don't know why we were surprised when it happened here as, as well. Um, but I think that's the uh, American arrogance that we think that, uh, oh no, we won't uh, fall prey to that. And as a result, we also had uh, problems with mixed messaging. There wasn't one clear cohesive message from on top down. So there wasn't a national approach and not in the absence of national leadership, um, each uh, jurisdiction was uh, pushed to make their own decisions about what seemed best in that particular area. There was no standardized approach um, from across the country. There was not even a standardized approach, um, you know, statewide. I am happy that at least in Illinois, it seemed that uh, we had uh, politicians who were willing to listen to the science, although not universally, um, but we were able to make some uh, more positive decisions. Once it was clear that uh, the infection was uh, so prevalent within the community that uh, contact tracing was no longer useful, the next um, th uh, hurdle for us was to deal with how could we, what could we provide people? As, as most people would call the country shut down. And it's actually surprising how many people heeded those uh, messages and, and actually stayed home when we asked the public to stay home. People immediately switched to uh, working remotely and recognized that we couldn't gather in small groups. We 
uh, shouldn't be surprised at all that um, we did not have uh, good and consistent messaging. Um, we did not get out into the community so people could understand. Initially, we were telling people not to wear masks. Forth. Um, so there was a lot of confused, confusing and mixed messaging, and um, we were late to the party to really come out with a concise um, messaging that the public could understand and made sense and give the reasoning behind it. And when you tell people to do something, they want to know why, what's the reason, and how long. And, and we were very slow with that. Um, when we did in, in uh, at the December of 2020 have a vaccine that we could finally offer, it was uh, then having to mobilize a workforce that would be able to provide vaccines to people and to meet people where they were. Um, there were people who were inherently suspicious of that. It had happened too quickly. Could they trust it? What were the side effects? Um, and how would it protect them? So, you know, I could go on a long time, but I say that basically because we were so slow getting out uh, of the gate and in terms of explaining to people what they needed to do, why they needed to do it, and how it be, would be beneficial. Um, and we didn't have the workforce in place to do that. And we didn't have relationships because uh, we had so few uh, public health workers um, at the time. So um, it's, it's, it's not surprising. I we were able to eventually mobilize in a, in a very big way in terms of vaccinating people, but the, addressing the issue of um, vaccine hesitancy, um, we really failed to uh, communicate with people in the venues where they with trusted voices um, early enough to be effective as we needed to be. So um, there were a lot of challenges there, but I'll stop. And uh, because I think we have folks from other uh, settings and, and we'll it'll give you a collective picture of what happened. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Pegan. Dr. Smith, can you talk a little bit from the FQHC perspective? So I would say that a lot of what Dr. Fagan mentioned affected FQACs as well. We faced unique and varying challenges during the different waves of the pandemic. Um, one of the biggest issues was the scarce reliable information at the beginning of the pandemic, which led to those sweeping lockdowns. And there is no playbook for when you're converting community clinics to remote work or virtual care, especially as she mentioned, when we've been under-resourced as far as infrastructure and our facilities, so moving uh, all of our workforce to home um, with not updated technology, we did receive money later on in the pandemic, but that was a tremendous challenge um, so that we could accommodate the fluidity of the pandemic changes and mandates having uh, digitally, being digitally enabled to not only provide that connection to our homes for our employees, but also to our patients as well. The patients that we serve historically has been disenfranchised and they had to be considered as we looked at how we could have new and creative ways to continue to get them the necessary access to information as well as resources. Our patients have many social determinants of health needs. So food, getting access to testing and even basic necessities. Um, some of our patients did not have access to water because of utility shutoffs. So how could we, when they're locked down and quarantined at home, make sure that they had hand sanitizer and water because we were having them stay home and we know that that was very important. So that was a huge issue for us. The lack of a unified federal government approach in conjunction with the coordination efforts between the state and local level also led to some inequities in testing. We you know, had difficulties getting testing supplies when testing became available, medical supplies, and even critical PPE to keep our staff safe. So that was an issue in the supply chain disruption. Unlike larger health systems, we couldn't afford to pay exorbitant amounts uh, for N95 masks and needed some guidance as well as when N95 masks were actually the thing that we had to use. We found out that we may have not needed them in all situations. So having that information and guidance was critical. In addition to that, the communication issues that were mentioned before, we have communities that already have a significant distrust in large institutions and government as well. And so having that kind of disjointed communication with the information that I spoke to caused us problems down the road. When testing was available and we were doing pop-up clinics in collaboration with others, we were finding patients who initially felt for whatever reason that COVID, for example, didn't affect people of color. 
the first death in Chicago actually was a woman of color. And so, you know, when we're out in the community, the myths and the disinformation that was out there that the testing was causing uh, us to insert the vaccine or the virus into their noses when we were doing the testing or hearing from patients that they did not have available masks because the local grocery store or the gas station where they frequented to get supplies was charging $5 for disposable masks. So figuring out the way that we could get the contributions that we receive in donations to patients at those testing sites was rather surprising and shocking that we didn't have ways of um, getting those necessary supplies to patients when we're asking people to wear masks. Um, we also had to really figure out a way to meaningfully engage the communities to build trust and respect to enable them to actually take advantage of testing and vaccinations included um, when they came about. As was mentioned before, just that the communication was a huge issue. So we had communities of color who were very reluctant to take advantage of vaccinations. And even when they were available, making sure that they were in the communities that needed them. I think sometimes when we talk about health equity, we think that means equal. And sometimes we have to focus on those communities that are hardest hit, that we know suffer huge healthcare disparities and focusing on them first, rather than kind of having this everybody has access because we know they lack like transportation, they lack access points. And so we really had to work on addressing those issues as well. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And Dr. Martell, can you talk a little bit about from the from all of these questions from or whatever you'd like to from the public health department perspective? Well, and I, I think all of us would say what always fails is communication. And we all know there was no communication really that was a national strategy. And when I come back to that, and it continues to be a challenge for all of us as we go through the different phases of this pandemic. But similar to what we've heard from my FQHC and my hospital system partners, what we all suffered from was really staffing capacity. We too, um, as we geared up and ramped up, um, the, the surge capacities of our systems, what we call in emergency preparedness, were not capable of handling what came in. From the volume of new cases to the amount of contact tracing, to recognizing that a health department, you know, when you had maybe four or five communicable disease investigators, they were doing their routine communicable disease investigation, and then we added on additional cases. It gave us some chance, I think, for some of the public in those early phases, we did not have the staffing capacity, so the surge capacity, what we call it. We did not have the information technology infrastructure. You heard it from Dr. Smith, um, you know, as well. We did not have robust computer systems that were able to take these cases in. Our first days were done on paper and they were being filed. And I think about the volumes of paper you would walk through. Um, we activated what was called the Medical Reserve Corps, which um, at that time we benefited from shutdown. I'm going to say stay at home orders uh, that we were able then to, we were using court reporters, we were using uh, individuals from the county government and schools that uh, were not, you know, the medical schools that were kind of sent home and we, we kind of not rustled that army, but it also became a challenge, right, because these are individuals who are not uh, typically involved and enrolled in the public health system, but we certainly had to do that if we were going to maintain that now. And being a relatively small health department, we had cover a population about 300,000, about half lit reside in the city of Rockford, similar to the city of Chicago when you look at, you know, uh, disparities and concerns. But really, we never lost contact tracing, but the volume that we were attempting to do with the level of staffing that we had and then keeping up with the documentation was incredible. I mean, I, I think about what those early days were like. Um, I also want to talk about, I, I don't think from the public health side of the house, I'm going to say, that we truly understood the fragility of the hospital system side of the house. Um, in the sense of when all of a sudden my hospital systems were overwhelmed by numbers of individuals coming into the emergency departments, needing ventilator care, needing inpatient hospital care, 
Um, I don't think that when we talk about our public health system, that we were all truly aware of the capacity restraints and all of that. Um, our new model of delivering healthcare, I'm gonna call it more the just-in-time, smaller beds, uh, smaller, you know, kind of, uh, I'm gonna say outpatient, a geared toward, you know, people recovering at home. This was not the disease for this. Um, and so we were really, our system, I'm gonna say was ill-prepared for the volume of patients that required the level of care that hospitals needed to provide. And with it came all the supply chain, I'm gonna call it, you've heard them talk about, um, you know, we heard the same thing because we were also part of that response to try and obtain PPE for our hospital systems, what that was like to go and secure supplies. How to, I mean, when we talked about PPE shortages and really conservation of PPE, how long could you use that for? They were relying on us to give them that guidance and we were ill-equipped really to understand that completely. Um, and so I think that became a real challenge for us that the science, I'm gonna call it the science evolving, which became part of the challenge in communication, right? People say, well, the message you gave me last week is different this week. Well, the science was evolving, it was changing what we knew, what we understood about the you know, disease at the time. When I think about when we told people about not sequestering their mail and groceries outside of the house and wiping down everything until you know, then no masking, then masking. I think that that part was, we were prepared for that constant of really rapid evolution of information and that trust gap. We already knew we had a trust gap, but it widened the trust gap. And that basic, you know, really understanding of who do I trust to get my best information from? Um, and when it changes, how can I alert the public that it's changing? The other part that probably, and I don't know, uh, we were probably more on the ground level of this one is social media. I don't think any of us ever appreciated the influence of social media um, and the, the challenge that we had with misinformation, disinformation, and I'm gonna just say constant recycling of information. Was that new or was that old from a week ago? And keeping the public as engaged as possible in that. We too pivoted um, while we never, we maintained about half of our workforce in the offices. The other half, um, most people do not expect their government workers to be working from home. So that was a, a culture shift about how do you, you know, can they safely, you know, I'm gonna say productively work from home. I think there was a lot of challenges and similar to both Dr. Smith and Dr. Fegan, we had people that, you know, we had to make sure they had the right equipment to be able to work from home. How do you secure people's information when you're working from home? Uh, there were those kind of logistical, um, you know, protecting health information. And then at the end of the day, I said at one point when my only tool was to stay, tell you to stay home, I really felt challenged as a public health. I thought we would have evolved in the century of understanding what it would create, what we would need to really manage a pandemic. We'd gone through influenza you know, exercises, pandemic influenza, we'd done through other dispensing exercise, but nothing prepared us for a disease that we had very, uh, the, the basic tool was, stay home, wash your hands, you know, um, kind of routine. And I think that that was from a kind of an intellectual scientific side, it was really hard to accept that that's all I had to offer. Um, and then similar to the, you know, as we kind of transition from the, you know, contact and the case investigations and really recognizing, I think all of us um, as we went to say, okay, how do we plan? And we were planning and responding at the same time. I think we were, you know, really having to look at how would we roll out vaccination, recognizing the equity concern. And, and we were very upfront about, we did not have the personnel to hand register everyone in our community. And so we really had to rely on technology um, and whatever meeting people were that, you know, it's no longer, you know, just tablets and you had to be able to cell phone, mobile enabled. And then how are we going to, as phases roll out, basically offer people appointments first in the equity chain based on their responses. And so that became, you know, both, a, I'm going to say challenges and opportunities to really do that. We were kind of having to plan that as we were still responding to this large influx of cases. Um, so, you know, when I think about when I kind of summarize it, I think that, you know, communication was a huge 
consideration for all of us. Um, the whole structure of the public health system and the fragility of it, um, I still kind of can't sometimes get over it when I look at what, how we had to respond, whether it was, you know, clinics all the way up to our health systems, really the public health workforce and capacity of that workforce to respond. And then really what are the basic tools we have in public health for a communicable disease or a pandemic of this type? Oh, thank you. This is, this is, I'm taking notes fast and furiously. So this is, that was a wonderful segue to the, to the next area I'd like to ask you each to explore a little bit. So you've illuminated, uh, I'm sure I'll miss something, but among the three of you, you've illuminated several deficits that really became exposed. One is the shortage of workforce in all of your systems in different ways. One is communication, that we need better communication strategies and, and better communication from all levels of government and within, the, within your systems. The fragility of our systems, of the hospital system, Sandy, as you pointed out, but I think everybody really noticed the fragility of your own systems and, and those that you're dependent on. The lack of IT and infrastructure in the information technology um, and the lack of tools that, um, that we should have been better prepared. So I think I'd like to segue you to, to talk a little about changes, additional changes that you may not have mentioned so far that you've made in response to these gaping holes that you, that you saw, changes that you've made, and are there any that you don't see a solution for or that you need an external solution? You need money or you need government policy. Um, so Dr. Fegan, back to you. Can you talk a little about what you see it kind of on the horizon and yeah and well I mean you know everyone needs money I mean because we need to uh expand the resource we need to expand um we did finally figure out uh platforms that we could uh meet on you know um we did uh find a way to secure um our uh connectivity so that we could have a workforce that was working remotely but it's not without problems right um, it's not the same as having people in, in, in person and being able to have conversations. And there's certain things that need to happen. And one of the things um, need to happen in person. One of the things when we sent everybody home, when we did patients, we did telehealth uh, visits, but there are some things you can't substitute a physical exam. And what we see now as a consequence of two years of people being afraid to come in, if they're coming in sicker with more advanced problems that we, if we had been following that heart failure, we would have uh, seen that patient before they decompensated. We would have heard their lungs and heard the fluid there. If we had um, had an hemoglobin A1C, we would have realized that diabetes had swung way out of control. And, and people made all kinds of choices or decisions because, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Smith alluded to, you know, they didn't have income coming in. And in terms of their, their dietary choices, in terms of being able to pay their bills, people lost their jobs. People who were in the uh, workforce in the um, uh, service industries were, were sent home and they weren't getting paid. And, um, and so they made choices, they went without. And as a result, we're seeing now, um, the patients we see in the emergency department are sicker and have advanced problems that you know really went untended you know, in terms of patients who went without medications, patients who couldn't figure out how to navigate, you know, to talk to their physicians, because even if we had the technology, they didn't have the technology uh, to be able to uh, communicate with their caregivers. So there was a lot of care that did not occur as, as a result of this. And while we did figure out how to do, you know, virtual meetings, we did figure out how to, you know, allow some folks to work remotely. We were not able to address the needs of our vulnerable populations to the extent they needed. And that's still the case. And so we can fool ourselves. We can say, oh, well, look, we have, you know, just if we're having this meeting and we're having it, it virtually, everyone's not in the same place. We have patients who um, are way behind in terms of their treatment and the things that they need because they have not had the access that they need um, to uh, direct patient care. Um, we understand, um, you know, and, and what what we don't know what the next variant will be. Um, we have gotten to a point where we at least now, at the, in the beginning, we didn't have treatment. And, and Sandy talks about how frustrating it was to not be able to tell people to do anything but keep their distance and wear a mask um, was utterly frustrating for the, the medical community. And uh, 
but it did promote communication between people who would normally be competing forces. I have to say that the chief medical officers of all the hospitals in, in the area, we were having regular phone calls and we were saying, well, we're trying this and this seems to be working or this shows some promise. And so when, when somebody had a, a treatment or an application, something that seemed to be working, we did open up lines of communication that I think allowed us to spread it from uh, hospital to hospital quickly. So that was a positive thing. I think that um, in terms of resources, we still have not been able to provide patients what they need to maintain uh, contact with their physicians. You know, we had been doing some pilot work before COVID where we were providing patients with uh, access to pulse oximetry and access to glucose monitoring and blood pressure and weight. And so we, we had a few dozen patients who had those things and it could feed directly into our computers. But we really need to have more access to technology for patients so that they can, um, you can do a more reasonable assessment and really figure out uh, what their needs are and ensuring um, that they're in contact. And so we didn't have um, the organization. And I, I think a lot of people actually say, okay, so patients were reaching out to us, but there were patients who were falling through the cracks who weren't reaching out, who didn't know how to contact them, who, who um, you know, didn't know what they should do or where they should go. So that was, that was very problematic. And I, I really think that we have to develop an approach that is a much more local, hyper-local approach uh, to get information to people, to uh, talk to, to folks. And, and even our workforce, as we tried to provide information to the workforce about who needed to wear what PPE, you know, no, the nurse in the emergency room doesn't need to wear two gowns and she doesn't need to, you know, but she does need to have that N95 on and she does need to have eye coverings because we saw that that was an exposure and helping people understand that um, if you're taking care of someone where you know they have COVID or you don't know their status, that it's the same in terms of the amount of protection you need to have. So um, in terms of things that we did, like I said, we were able to do our administrative work, but what's still lacking, I think, is um, a really good, easy platform for patients uh, to have communication um, with healthcare givers and to make sure that, um, you know, a lack of, of resources is not the reason why uh, folks, you know, folks needed um, they needed food, they needed shelter, and they needed uh, good, good access to have their questions answered. We failed because we, you know, social media was far more efficient, as Sandy alluded to, than the medical establishment was in terms of getting good, solid, science-based information to the public. And in that, that void, um, it was filled with a lot of uh, mishigash, you know, a lot of uh, misinformation and uh, uh, things that were difficult for us to overcome as a healthcare system. And kind of building on Claudia, what Claudia's talking about, the digital divide, you know, I, I think that the partnership that we developed with was with our public schools. I mean, when I saw them, I mean, here we, we started to kind of come down a little bit sooner because we said, we're a little health department, I can't handle more than 25 cases at any given time. So, you know, that was in the early phases. And we started that talk with our schools about getting the Chromebooks out and all of that, but we still have this challenge, which is connecting, right? How do they connect up? We still have this concern about the number of individuals and in a county like ours, it also is a rural community portion their access to the technology and to the things that, you know, we could push a message out on a Chromebook, you know, but could they receive it? Was there, you know, we heard about the stories about people pulling up outside the library just so they could get the free Wi-Fi signal going. Um, and so we had people moving more so, but if we don't address that, the technology that we are dependent on, um, and again, to improve and to be able to manage the next infectious disease, we've got to get ourselves positioned so that population, the group, the community has access where they're at um, and, and able to be able to not only access service, but us to push it to them. If we knew, right? I mean, that was part of our kind of solution when we said, okay, I'm using my system now to push out messaging, right? So, you know, um, just again, trying to figure out. So if we get into a Wi-Fi hotspot, can I send up a geofence, right? 
about here we are today. Can you come? You know, we know that many of our clients, we also transitioned in Illinois and WIC during all this. It went to electronic benefits, praise the you know. I won't tell you how happy that it made us all, but that ability to like send a communication, right? You know, hey, we're open. Have you checked your hemoglobin A1C? You know, hey, we've missed you. You know, I, again, using the same thing when you walk into the target and they know exactly what your list should look like. Um, I think we really have to make sure that we're prepared for the next one. And we need those dollars from an infrastructure standpoint it's as important as building, you know, roads and bridges is that, you know, I'm going to call it that infrastructure throughout the entire community to support all of our, you know, areas. I would agree with that. I think that um, one of the silver linings, I think, from all of this was really the collaborative efforts. I think people working outside of their silos and with organizations they traditionally had not worked with was something that was helped to strengthen the entire system. I think cutting out some level of bureaucracy and red tape that we saw with even public health organizations working together um, to ensure that people got the information they needed by working together, um, I think was really helpful. And I would hope that as we you know, move out of this phase that some of that red tape and bureaucracy could continue, we could continue to work together without all the layers that we have to traditionally go through and continue with the collaborative efforts with academic medical centers, with our community-based organizations, with departments of public health, because I think that works really, really well. I think the city's uh, racial equity rapid response team and hearing directly from providers as well as community organizations and communities themselves, the faith, um, based organizations, churches, and the community members themselves was really also a great way to kind of get that on the ground and hyper local efforts going as far as education, as far as figuring out vaccines and figuring out how we could deploy more creative ways of getting out into the community. I would hope that at the end of this, we don't lose some of these lessons and scaffold from some best practices that we learned from this. Um, and not, you know, years down the road, not build upon them. You know, I don't think it's always, I don't want to say sexy, uh, to have kind of the preparedness and infrastructure funding for that, but I think it's absolutely necessary. It seems boring, but I think that, you know, we see what happens when you are not prepared, when we don't have the infrastructure in place, when we're not continually investing in facilities, we're not continually investing in technology, the way we communicate with each other. If we don't take anything from that, we do have to have funding for those type of activities as well. Thank you all. You're, you're touching on so many of the questions I had. So one, one of the fears that I have, and then I want to turn it to you to ask you about the fears you have at this stage of the pandemic. One of the fears I have is that maybe we've declared um, going back to normal a little prematurely and that we have a lot of money coming from the federal government that will support infrastructure and workforce for the next couple of years, but that will that we have short memories and and we'll go back to we'll go back to whatever was normal before uh, prematurely. So so those are two of my fears I want to put out there. So I'd love to hear from you guys about given where we are right now in this pandemic, it's not over, even though a lot of people would like to think it is. Well, I see, a couple, of I see a couple of people making reference to the fact that the CDC became a, a political uh, machine instead of being scientifically based. And um, I think the decision to, uh, you know, discard the mask and, you know, it was a political decision. It wasn't necessarily fully based in science. It's true that we are down to very low uh, positivity rates, but I'll remind people that the positivity rates now do not mean the same thing that they meant at the beginning of the pandemic because so many people are doing home testing. So we don't know really how many people are positive because you know that doesn't get fed into the database the way it was when people had limited access to testing. Um, and limited access to testing meant we also didn't know the full breadth of people being infected because not everybody had access to testing. 
You know, I could, at the hospital, I could walk downstairs and go in and get tested, but where do other folks decide, you know, how are they going to do that? Where are they going to get the test? And the tests aren't free at a lot of places, you know, if you have to purchase it. But definitely the decision that uh, because, and, and I get it because the, the, the service industry was, is dying as a result. And, you know, I, how many small businesses went out of business because they didn't have uh, customers. And, you know, the fact that our government, unlike other governments and other parts of the world where they made a decision that they would supplement people and, 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 you know, tied them over through this period, we left a lot of folks on their own. And so small businesses, restaurants, um, you know, eating establishments, uh, lo you know, lost customers, lost business and couldn't pay their mortgages and, and they closed. And so, there created a huge amount of pressure that we should stop. Uh, you know, we're getting better. We're over Omicron. We need to stop wearing masks. And at the same time we decided to stop wearing masks, we also decided to stop requiring people to be vaccinated. So some people would say, if you let people eat together and, you know, at, at Cook County Health, we have recognized that this was a huge way in which people became infected when they would eat and drink together. And so the idea that we say, okay, well, yeah, how much, you know, you can't wear a mask and eat, the, eat at the table with other folks. That's not going to happen. So you decide you're going to open up the restaurant, but you also decide that you are not going to stop checking people's vaccination status. And that was purely a political decision. And it had to do with the fact that the, um, you know, social, the service industry had, had needed an, an FTE to be at the front door to check for that vaccination status. And so we caved to that. So we threw out what we knew to be good science to accommodate folks who were suffering economically. And what a, a better decision would be if we had decided to support some of these uh, struggling uh, businesses um, and, and allowed uh, us to make more reasonable decisions. But, you know, the double speak that we got from the CDC and, and other entities and what was a clearly a political decision, um, you know, hamstrung us, you know, some of us who know better, um, you know, no longer felt the backing of government listening to science and um, it's problematic. So it's true that we seem to be over the Omicron surge, but I'm just going to point out that we know that wearing masks works. Um, not only did we see it could help us control um, COVID, it helped us control influenza. We had virtually no influenza uh, right. in 2020 and, and 2021. And, you know, it's, it's this, people said, well, I'm tired of it. I, I don't, uh, I'm not comfortable. You know, sometimes you have to do things for the greater good. And and what we threw out was the willingness of the society to do what we knew was the right thing for the uh, uh, greater good. And it is, it's very problematic. And, and I would kind of piggyback on that. I mean, here's, here's the challenge, though. And I'm going to offer another little discussion or argument. Maybe we're in a, I call it the self-care phase of the pandemic. Um, and again, the challenge is communicating so people can make informed choice. So this is where that reporting of the positivity and the case rate and the community level versus community transmission go on those two websites and the CDC creates confusion for the community. So as infection rates come down, it's appropriate you can remove one layer at a time. I'm in a community that has a lot lower vaccination rate than you know, Chicago or some of my other collar counties. We can be, for those unvaccinated, become then potential sources of really variant transmission. And so getting that, so if I'm going to remove masking, then I got to keep the vaccination. You know, I know I've heard it referred to as the Swiss cheese, but we called it the layering. But really now we're in a self-care phase, meaning people have to understand if you're not fully vaccinated and now make it more confusing, boosted or up to date on your vaccination. Let's make that as confusing as we possibly can. Um, you know, again, make you sure if you're vulnerable that you still, if you're in a large group gathering where you can't maintain social distancing, then you should be wearing a mask. I mean, and that, that's a hard one for people. But Sandy, this is the thing, this is the thing. It's like, 
you know, what, what we have failed to help the public understand is I wear my mask to protect you. you. I need you to wear your mask to protect me. And so telling people, well, if you want to continue to wear a mask, that's fine. But what really protects me is the person who may have COVID wearing a mask. And exactly. it's not going to protect me if I'm wearing a mask and the person who has COVID sure. in the room with me doesn't. And so I, I just, you know, again and again, I would like people to say, I need you to wear a mask. Right. And yeah. I don't think we're, the, and again, that's where the challenge is, which is, you know, when you go out, you know, people say, why are you wearing a mask? Isn't it safe? I'm saying I'm wearing it to protect you. And I think that that's, you know, that the challenge is, is understanding what risks are we going to take? I mean, you know, you think about the weather report, you know, if it's going to rain, they give you at least a little bit of a report. How reliable is it? But right now we have a lot of mixed messaging as how much is being transmitted in this community? There are two sites with on the CDC site. One shows you in red, orange, you know, your it's hot spots, and the other one is green, yellow. And we we are green on one and red on another. Now, okay, here again is a little bit of that mixed. Here again, it's a lot of mixed messaging. So if I want to take appropriate actions to protect myself, if I'm auto, you know, if I have an immunocompromising situation, maybe I know that, you know, maybe again, I don't want got new babies in the family, whatever that is. And I think that that's the challenge we've got right now, which is we're in this kind of, I call it the self-care, everyone at their own risk. And yet we've lost that collective, which is really kind of the saddest thing that I see when we all stayed home, right? We did it. We protected each other. That was the goal. Um, why did people wear masks in the schools? Initially, it was because the children still can't get vaccinated. We have a still group that cannot get vaccinated. Um, and yes, they have a lower rate of, you know, disease transmission based on what we know today. But again, the idea being, why, you know, why wouldn't I want to do that? It's an inconvenience. We agree. We, none of us, you know, uh, but at the same token, it's something that I do to protect those who cannot receive vaccination. And again, it's that social responsibility, but it's very much, we're in this phase now, I call it self-care. We send you self-tests home. You got to test yourself. We're not letting you, you know, we're going to make sure that you get that. And I think that's another interesting concept. Less than 50% of our tests last time from the government have been distributed to people. People are not wanting that, that, you know, I, I, they're not ready. Many in our community are not ready for that self-care phase. And yet we've given them that uh, level of decision-making without the tools to really make the decision. Or understand what the decisions actually are. I mean, to rely on people to be checking two different websites and relying on information, it's not going to happen. I mean, we just talked about the digital divide. So how are people even accessing this information in a way that is meaningful and understandable to them? I think it's way too complex. We have people coming in every day now. If you're in a healthcare, you have to wear a mask, but the public doesn't have to wear a mask. It's just incredibly complex and confusing and needs to be distilled down to something that actually makes sense to people. And then putting the genie back in the bottle, if we do have high transmission rates, now asking everyone to put masks back on again after having a period of not having to wear them, I think it's just going to be really difficult. I know we all are weary, but it's a very simple thing, as you both have said, to protect others as well as yourself. It's that whole, you know, we, we're in the beginning of this. I told my husband we we're having a conversation. I said, this is going to be difficult for Americans because we believe so much in personal freedoms that having this collective responsibility to take, you know, take consideration of others and your own personal rights being, you know, aside and looking at the whole collective has always been something difficult. In Asia, this is not a big deal of wearing masks every day. <laughs> it's not, you know, something in Italy when they had to do it and they remained on lockdown. But we just are very into personal freedoms where, you know, it doesn't matter about someone else's rights. I'm only concerned about mine. And I, I, I'm talking one of the chats about the essential workers and right, no taken. The essential workers work throughout that. And we worked, I, you know, I, I'm gonna say that I went on buses to show them how to put the plexiglass up and the areas around 
again, recognizing we have some po portions of our population that really could not stay at home. They were out in the essential workforce. And it's interesting, again, you know, as I see, you know, you just anecdotally see many of my drivers are still in my community mm -hmm. when you see the buses are still wearing their masks as well as on the school buses. I mean, which again, makes no intellectual sense. We wear them as adults, but then you don't wear them as kids. I mean, this, you know, again, that inconsistent messaging. I also come back to as adults modeling behavior for children. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I may tell my child, right? Because again, you start thinking about this in some scenarios, they wear masks and others we don't. And, and I think again, for that consistency, I've seen families where the parents aren't masked, but the kids are because they couldn't get vaccinated. Um, you know, they're too small yet. And I think we've really, the communication comes back out again as one of the challenges. And I'm gonna say policy by presser. So this is, you know, I'm gonna say to the, the policy um, wonks on our call here today that really are, is that we have managed a lot of this pandemic by policy, by press release and press conference. Um, I will tell you, even as well as we stood together in Illinois, many times we were scrambling as the press conference was going on for how to implement and message that policy. Um, because there was so much um, concern about how information was flowing, that it often was held. And so we were in a reactionary versus a proactive state of how could we effectively implement that policy and message it. More importantly, I'm going to say message it, right? Why are we messaging it like that? So um, I think that that's, you know, we, we you know, used to say, don't miss a press conference because you're going to miss a policy. <laughs> You feel like we've we've learned from that 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 going going into the inevitable next uh, pandemic or next emergency, we will have learned some of those lessons, Sandy, that you were you're pointing out about messaging, or that we've implemented some policies or some practices in your systems that that will help moving forward. You know, I feel like they they do understand the communication piece, thus the. Uh, daily or weekly uh, press conferences. However, we're still making political decisions instead of scientific decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that is a huge problem for us. Um, you know, so people are trying to decide what is politically feasible, right? So it's just as Dr. Smith said, you know, how do you, you know, do this, you know, whiplash, you, you say, okay, take the mask off, okay, put them back on. You're not gonna be able to get people to put them back on right. um, as easily as you got them to, to take it off. And um, so that's why uh, a more measured approach is, is important. But um, as, as you have all this noise on the other side about personal freedom, that um, it, it blocks out uh, what we were willing to do in the beginning of the pandemic, we were willing to do make some collective decisions for the good of everybody. And uh, we've lost that. And now we have a lot of politicians uh, speaking about, you know, we have taken away uh, people's personal freedoms. And, you know, th these are, you know, these are people who are not students of history. I mean, because look at the decisions we made when we had polio, look at the decisions we made Darn. <laughs> I think I froze there, but you, did, I, you, I you, was, you mentioned we, polio and then right. Yeah. So look at the decisions we made on the basis of polio. Look mm -hmm. at the decisions we made with even the, the flu in, in 1919, 1918. Um, we decided as a society, there were certain expectations that we created and we created, you know, pressure for, for that. And it, it wasn't about personal freedom. It was about the survival in a community. And when you think about Margie, we talk about a million people dying, a million people dying. We don't have a million people die in war. And, and the idea that because we're, we every day talk about how many people die and it gets dismissed. These are each tragedy. You know, I talk to my docs in the critical care unit and they tell me, you know, I was up all night with a 42 year old mother of four who died and she wasn't vaccinated and I could have saved, we couldn't save her. And the 
just the the heartfelt, you know, pain of, you know, that family, let alone the people who took care of that patient and tried to save her. And we are dismissive of the numbers, the, the staggering numbers of people who have died and the people who have been disabled by this illness. And I know I've seen some chats in the long haul COVID. We're still dealing. I mean, I, again, I don't, I, I, we're dismissive. Is that people don't, they aren't valued. And it's another sign, you know, that we don't have our value systems in place where we were okay. I mean, I, I think, you know, I got the long-term care perspective group calling us. I mean, we had some, you could imagine they were in long-term care, but those initial deaths occurred at high rates within those long-term care facilities. And the workers who worked in those were being accused of bringing the infections in, right? And spreading it amongst the residents. They were grieving the patients at their families. These were long-term relationships. They worked with these patients for years. And then, you know, we, we come back to is if, if everybody was dispensable. Well, you know, we didn't even think about the folks who were, you know, had no choice, you know, you can't be a, a, a nurse uh, remotely, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be at the bedside, uh, you know, you can't deliver mail, uh, you know, digitally. We can't, you know, we, we forget, it. you can't transport people, drive a bus, drive a cab, you know, all the folks who didn't have a choice Right. Um, and were exposed and had, you know, little or no protection and got sick and then lost their source of income and had no, you know, support. We just have failed to, to acknowledge um, the folks who are out there on the front line. And I think we're only beginning to see the trauma that to all of these workers and to families and to kids who haven't been able to learn. That, that's all still to come. We're, we'll see that unfold. Uh, so I want to take a couple of the questions from the audience. So, so um, let's start with this. Uh, I am troubled by the way the CDC has become so irresponsible in enforcing masking and vaccinations. What can we do to put pressure on larger government institutions to represent the truth and do what's needed to eradicate COVID? No small questions here. Anybody got some ideas on this? Well, I, I'm going to say from the public health side, I, I probably didn't even get to tell you about how fun that was to enforce mask orders and mask mandates. Um, now, and again, we did not, I represent a health department that does not have a home rule community in it, so they could not decide otherwise. But my environmental inspectors and myself would go out and enforce these orders, you know, when there were capacity limits, people weren't to do indoor dining, the, the angst and the hostility. And at some point, you know, you really have to, when you talk about that enforcement, everybody has to be on board because, you know, did your, and I hate to say your law enforcement didn't want to get involved in this, right? I mean, we, and we didn't want to make everything a law enforcement issue, right? I mean, that's not where we want to be in so many of our communities. The second part was, you know, what, what enforcement are we willing to do? How much fining? I mean, there was a lot of discussion, but at the end of the day, did, did you know, again, when you say enforce, I really would want to know what that would look like because I can tell you that we pulled restaurant licenses and permits. Those were posted. You know, to Claudia's point, then I just probably made them more economically challenged, right? Um, and those are the ones I knew about, right? Because I'm sure that some were, you know, we were doing complaint based. Um, so, I mean, I think that when we decide what it is, I think that we have to really then go forward with it, whether it's vaccination requirements, you know, it, here's what the, a mandate is, here's where it has to be, here's what you, you know, and, and it keep it in tow. I think that's what we're faced with now, which is some of those workforce mandates and things like that have eroded. And there's great confusion. I can tell you, I get calls all the time. Is this still in place or not? Do I have to provide proof? You know, um, and, and that's really challenging us when you think about from the science standpoint of the number of people completed a primary series, but didn't complete the booster, 
and where we're at on that whole scenario. So when you say enforcement, I, I really want to know a little bit more from that audience, you know, from that individual, what did they mean by that? What would they recommend for us to enforce? Yeah. <laughs> well, masking and vaccinations is what they're in, in the question. I only have what I, what I see in the question. So more thinking about the pushing the CDC to, to enforce their jobs. Thank you, Mr. Estrada. Oh. Any other comments from our well, panelists? I always I go back to Dr. Turnock, Bernie Turnock, that talked about public health is inherently political. Um, and so, We've got to be more politically strateg you know, strat we've really got to strategize. And I, you know, I, I know that we typically kind of stay in the background until it becomes something that gets in front of us. But you know, a lot of things we've talked about here are really huge policy issues that we need to demand our government to do, right? So yeah. whether it's you know, monies, you know, for you know, when you're out for if we have to close you down for an infectious disease or for whatever reason, what are the structural supports in there? And how long are they for? I mean, look, they just didn't fund the next round of COVID, right? Um, how do we make sure that everyone, you know, has access to testing? What is it, you know, all those pieces need to be put in place. Everyone having access, reliable, you know, I, you know, I don't know if it's 5G or 10G will be the next. I'm sure I'll, whatever I say, it'll be the next. But we've really got to make sure that we are demanding that our system provides that through the political structures. Um, and, that, and I think a lot of us have had to been so busy in response that we haven't been able to be as active politically on that front as we would like to be. Yeah, it's an accountability issue, right? It, to, to make uh, decisions based on the science as opposed to what you think the public will tolerate. And right now we're making decisions about what we think people will find acceptable because uh, there's so much pushback. It's incredible how angry and hostile um, and physically violent people become um, when you, 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 you push on them. And, and it's like, yeah, you need to wear your mask on your, covering your nose and your mouth. And, you know, I, <laughs> as a patient, I said, you know, do you wear your mask below your nose? And she said, well, I can't really breathe if it's above my nose. And I was just like, well, it's not really working. <laughs> you know, let's try to figure this out. Can we get you a different type of mask or, you know, but it's, we, we, we need to make decisions based on um, science and, and we need to hold um, our, our bodies, you know, why the CDC just became so wishy-washy and abandoned um, you know, they, they, they savaged their own credibility. Uh, it was very problematic. And uh, because it became a state-by-state -state response, um, we did better in some states than others as a result. And, you know, that should not be with, in a country that spends as much on healthcare as we do. Um, and we already know that we, you know, don't, we don't provide health access to healthcare to a third of the population who are either uninsured or underinsured. And not taking care of those folks endangers everyone, right? No one is safe until everyone is safe. And the fact that we didn't guarantee, you know, making the vaccines free, that was a good thing. But, you know, now, you know, you still have to make sure that everyone has access to what they need because one person, um, you know, is a risk for all. To um, do better. I think advocacy is the key. Uh, once again, this whole issue, I think, is politically driven. And right now, we, we have people who are, as you said, violent about wearing masks and doing those things. But I think that that group is also a minority. And so we need people to be vocal, especially scientists, about the right thing to do and engage in the political process. I know many of us think that is, you know, kind of a nasty thing and people don't want to get involved, but we really have to advocate for our own health and the health of each other by participating in the process and making sure our voices are heard as well. I think that's so right. And Sandy's point when we started this round of the question that public health is political and 
and if we think otherwise, we're we're thinking it, it's at, at our own jeopardy because it it is true. And if we don't engage in the political process and in voting and advocacy, we're going to lose. So absolutely, you know, and the notion that we that the politicians decided COVID is over, we don't have to fund it again, <laughs> um, is just like insane. Like who were they listening to, right? This is, you know, and it is our, and, and Dr. Smith is absolutely right. It is our responsibility to advocate for our patient. Right. You know, and I, I tell docs that all the time that, you know, we are the most powerful voice when we are advocating for the needs of the people we serve. You know, no one wants to hear us whine or complain about what we don't have, but when we are advocating for the needs of our patient, we are a powerful voice and we need to use that voice. And we need to be in the face of the politicians who are making bad decisions and saying uh, nonsense. And uh, I mean, I, I think that that, you know, that's a, Margie, you know, that's how I've been a lot of my career. <laughs> um, I, I know, but Claudia, here, here, I'm clapping under my desk right now. Absolutely. And I, I saw somebody giving you the signal. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. It's, it's that good trouble we have to create. We have to that's create. right. We got to get and we, it. And we, and we got to do it in an organized way, all of us. I mean, every one of your systems, the public health departments, the FQHCs, the hospitals and public systems, if we, if we don't all act together, we lose. Right. So let me take another question from uh, the audience here. COVID is airborne, not simply droplet borne. Why is our society not emphasizing that COVID transmission happens via the air and then investing massively in and requiring enhanced ventilation, HEPA air filtration, and mm -hmm. upper room ultraviolet germicidal yeah. irradi irradiation, right? That, that's, a, that's on us. That was, that was early on um, and, and really trying to look at this virus, this family of viruses, and making some assumptions. Um, and so we let people put up plexiglass and we said that it was a uh, droplet transmission and lo and behold, it was spreading much faster than it made sense. And, and you know, we, you know, at, at, as Dr. Smith talked about, as the science changed, our messaging wasn't very effective in terms of acknowledging that our, our knowledge is evolving. You know, we, we don't ever like to acknowledge our own uncertainty and our own insecurity, but we have to make decisions based on what we have at the time. And initially we thought it was droplet uh, transmission. Then it became really apparent that it was uh, aerosol, but we didn't go back and say, you know, hey, look, we, we, we made a mistake. We made a mistake and we need to do something different. Um, it's real hard for the public. And that's one of the reasons we have such poor credibility right now, but um, it, it, it's clear, you know, when Omicron can spread from across the room and you have to have only one person in the room and 10, you know, you 10 people and, and six of them are gonna get infected. That, that uh, you know, was a very painful lesson for us to learn and we paid a high price for it and we continue to pay a price for it. But, and I'm gonna come back to many of my, and when we were talking about the buses, we actually looked at the MER filters on the tops and the air flows. I learned more about the filtration systems than we, and many of our schools did invest in the additional, what we would call the ventilation systems. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge has been as, you know, again, making sure that people are using those dollars that came into the systems for that. There was, and I think all of us had to look at, it. I mean, we, we certainly do, we had, um, we were one of the only health departments, laughingly, I'm gonna say that did, uh, we did the monoclonals. And so we did it in a conference room and we had two HEPA filtration systems and, you know, good old fashioned open up the doors because that was, you know, in addition to typical PPE and things like that. But the idea being that we knew the filtration and the air ventilation system was one of the key strategies. But if you look at layering of mitigation, that is one of them and one of the higher ones. So we did use some of our money um, mm -hmm. to install some air filtration systems, particularly as we provide dental services. And we could not do that without having um, enhanced air purification, HEPA filters, et cetera. We would have had to keep the dental clinic closed down. But those are the type of infrastructure issues that we traditionally would not get funding for. And so just looking at how we can bring people to a more modern state as far as FQHCs with the money that can be invested in our facilities is key. 
And and do you feel like that is happening? It sounds like to some extent it is. It, it is. Our fear is there's still some ways to go. And when this is over, or when people decide politicians, as you said, that COVID is over, then what happens? Do we go another 15, 20 years waiting for the next pandemic to occur mm -hmm. for a infl huge influx of monies to be able to do some of these enhancements? And so that's like, how do we do this in a sustainable way, in a scientifically evidence-based way to ensure that we're keeping up to date as far as infrastructure to be where we want to be, to be prepared for the next go round of whatever it is. I want to remind folks in our audience, you can put questions in the Q&A. Um, okay. I th and I was going to say, I think our, our challenge is going to be to get people to accept the notion that COVID like influenza is something that you'll have to get a uh, more regular uh, vaccine for. And, uh, you know, that that just is not playing well. Folks are just, you know, so we talk yeah. about them getting the first two shots of the mRNA and then getting the booster to how many people didn't get a booster. And, and guess what the reality, you know, the, we would like the, um, the immunity to last longer. And I think that with time it will in terms of the shots we give and but variants will continue to come. And we get a shot for influenza on an annual basis um, because we understand that the virus is continuously evolving and COVID will continue to evolve. And it's the messaging behind that. If we were more straightforward, more direct and, and, and acknowledge that, um, then we would have more acceptance of it. And we do have short memories as, as uh, you know, we've talked about, because think about H1N1. Um, and again, um, that was in our vaccines for how many years following it? And, you know, people kind of forgot that, right? They, they thought, oh, I only had one, or, you know, the memory was short about what it took. Um, and again, we, we are learning more and more about immunity. Who thought that we'd have to be revaccinated as adults um, for so many of our childhood, you know, vaccine preventable diseases. And again, the science is evolving and changing and we need to be, we need to be able to pivot and message appropriately. Okay, I'm gonna take another question here that I think is a good one. Please comment on the massive federal, state and local privatization of funds including but not limited to testing, contact tracing, vaccines, including for the first time in history, the CDC bypassing health departments and shipping vaccine directly to Walgreens and CVS. <clears throat> yeah, so how about that acknowledging the fact that we don't have the infrastructure in place in public health? And that there is no way that if we had depended solely on the health departments, all no disrespect to anybody, but if right. we depended solely on the health departments, we never would have gotten it done. We were only able to stand up mass vaccination sites. I mean, you know, in a generation ago or ooh, two generations ago, that would have been a public health uh, entity. There is no way we could have mobilized enough uh, of a public health workforce to do the things that needed to be done. So we went to the places where the resources existed. And by the way, those resources, those folks were not working right then because everything else had been shut down. So it provided, there were people who went to work in these mass vaccination sites um, who were out of work um, service workers. <laughs> there were people who provided uh, assistance to us in many ways. So it was um, going to, you know, uh, uh, it, it, I remember there's a Canadian politician. He said, "You know, where where are you going to get the money from the from the people who have it? You know, wh where do we get the work done from the people who were there who could do the work?" And so it worries me that we have not continued to fund, and we don't use this opportunity, this little bit of a lull, to continue to build on the infrastructure that is so lacking in public health. Instead, we just yank the dollars back. And what we really need to do is this is the time to build our workforce and to build the resources that we'll need um, for the next variant or the next uh, pandemic. And again, I think that the kind of, one of the things we had been building many of our plans on was to include pharmacy partners. So, you know, part of that had been building for a while because we said there was a certain, you know, we really felt that that might be a model to support us. 
what we probably, while they were great for helping with vaccination, what we discovered and what we probably not discovered, but what wasn't planned for was the distribution of the therapeutics and the lack of equity related to pharmacy distribution of therapeutics, where it became a first come first serve. And that, you know, I think we really need to decide uh, when we're going to use that privatization and use private entities to support that, where is the best, um, you know, where can we put them and utilize them the best so that we can address some of those inherent structural deficits that we have related to equity concerns. And Dr. Smith, did you want to respond to that? All right. No, I agree with what has already been said. I, I don't know how we would have done it without um, using some of those pharmacies, but I do agree from an equity perspective, there were still problems that we have to think through and the best place and time to utilize those entities to provide certain services. That seems right to me, but I, I will caution us that we should remember Claudia's point about part of the reason we did have to go to the private sector is because we spent 40 years disinvesting in the public sector. And we could have actually done more in the public sector had we, had we invested over the last four decades. So related to that, um, there's a, a question in the Q&A about how you all have invested your dollars that have been coming down from the federal government in, in increasing staffing and supporting your systems. What have you concretely, what, what have you actually done with the funds so far or what are you planning in the near future? So we have done some infrastructure support as I talked about modernizing facilities, mm -hmm. the technological piece, making sure they were up to date, but we also have invested a lot in workforce and particularly with our providers. FQHCs have a very difficult time recruiting and retaining providers because we can't afford to pay what some of the larger health systems do. So we do have many staff that are included in some of our funding sources from the federal government. And we're looking at innovative ways of you know, recruitment as well. I mean, right now in healthcare, I think you meant, touched on this, the level of burnout for healthcare frontline workers and that's providers, MAs all, all around is a very, we're in a def, difficult spot right now. So figuring out ways where we can reconnect people to the meaning and purpose and what their work was in the first place where we can increase morale and where we can you know, get people to actually come back who have left and decided they are no longer interested in working in healthcare due to, you know, this situation. We had high levels of burnout prior to the pandemic and that just exacerbated, you know, the situation with healthcare workers, you know, suffering astronomical levels of burnout. Other, Sandy or Claudia, your investments? Well, one of the challenges, I mean, what we used dollars for was actually to hire a lot of, um, Temporary workers, right? Uh, you know, we hi, but you know what has happened to the nursing profession during this uh, time period is that it's become um, the highest bidder. So yes, there are people who are were burned out, but there were also nurses who decided, you know, I don't have to come in and be at the bedside um, every day. I can I can work for one week or two week as a traveler, make two or three times what I usually make, and then have you know, more time, you know, a week or two to myself. And so uh, we've seen a mass exodus and a bidding war uh, for nurses, right? And for other staff, but particularly for, for, for nurses. And so we wound up spending a fair amount of money um, to fill holes we had um, with staff that are agency staff or, or um, travelers. And, you know, this, these dollars are not, it's hard to, to fill your gaps um, and with, you know, if you're doing um, support to your, your building or, or doing corrections that need to happen to the, you know, those places, that's important. And that's, you can do with a, a grant, but the Okay. Are you back with us, Claudia? Okay, maybe Dr. Smith or Dr. Martell, do you want to tell us? Oh, Margie, I just, 
wanted to add another point that, as you recall, and we this has been a kind of repeated uh, theme here, that those funds are also, when they're grant funded, they are not sustainable funds. And so long term, you have to figure out, even if you use that for workforce shortages or staffing, how you're going to maintain that level of staffing long term when these grant funds run out. That's, That's exactly right. So you can't create jobs that, you know, how are you going to pay for that job in the future? I'm sorry, I'm having the... Uh, internet challenges. But, you know, the, the like I said, what we, we had done is underfunded public health for so long. And yet what we really need at this time is to build that workforce uh, in a sustainable way. And the uh, funding that's provided does not allow for that. No. It does allow for, um, like I say, modifications, improving ventilation and, and doing some of those things that are very helpful but it's the long-term sustainability. We need a workforce that would make us more nimble in response to the next uh, pandemic. And there will be another, there's no mm -hmm. question. Okay, another question from the group. How did a lack of distribution and testing in communities of color exacerbate the deaths, especially in the beginning of the pandemic? Oh my goodness! You know, so look, you talk about meeting people where they where they are, um, and you know, I talked about the need for hyper local. We did not go into those communities, um, and we did not provide. You know, I said, you know, so okay, so we have testing at the hospital, but that's not where where people are. And um, you know, I also don't think you know you can mail out as many kits as you want to, but not everybody has the wherewithal to perform a test. Right. On, on themselves or willing to do that. And so that's where you have to talk about the trusted voices or sources. Where do people get their information? You know, I've found, found some of the most effective um, ways to get people to do cancer screening is by going to the beauty shops and the barber shops, the beauty salon, and talking to people where they actually talk to others who they where they make decisions or going to the churches or going to the community centers. We are not meeting people where they are. So the lack of providing testing in the communities where people are, um, when we were telling everyone to stay home, um, you meant that people who got sick didn't know they have COVID, brought it into the household, and then, you know, that's where you had the mother and father both died, where you had um, households where, you know, the, the breadwinner, the, you know, the person who had to go out every day and work for the family uh, died because there was no, they didn't have access to know that, um, and, and believe me, uh, especially early on, people with COVID, they got sick and they went bad fast yes. very quickly like we were intubating people in the emergency room like in rapid succession and we and we had never seen anything like that before and so not being able to tell people quickly um and i was you know i was happy in our system we we turned around all the tests in, in less than 24 hours but there were people waiting two or three days waiting a week to get a result of a test by the time they had the result of the test they were already you know, s severely ill. So uh, the lack of providing people, not just testing, but quick turnaround in terms of their information and that prolonged turnaround, that was true of a lot of big fancy places. And so I'm gonna say that small clinics, small sites did not have the ability to give the people the information they needed when they needed it so they could make better choices. Um, and we lost people because of that. Uh, yeah, kind of coming to Claudia too. We were big on, and again, as soon as we could get our hands on it, we pushed test kits to the schools to use on the kids, the families, the you know, because again, it was kind of going to where they were at. We had a drive-up site, and we have a significant population that at one of our guard sites they wouldn't test the person; they rode up on a bicycle. Our homeless population rides bicycles. I'm like. Yeah, they're going to show up on a bicycle. You need to test them. Um, and again, meeting people where they're at. We did a walk arounds uh, in the early phases of masking, talking, you know, into some of our highest risk community door to door, you know, doing porch walks. We tell them porch talks, you know, knock on the door, you know. And oftentimes I say I got more steps in that time because I'd walk away and they come out and say, you know, grab me back, you know, and say, can you come talk to me about? We talk about why it's important to get tested, where could they go? 
Um, you know, oftentimes we also learned, I'm going to say from a standpoint of prevention messaging, all of them talk about people in your family and people were like, you know, we weren't clear about in your household, the people that live under the roof or the house with you, not inviting your extended family over. We lost some very valuable time in that first go around because people did not understand it as the holidays approached. You know, we had Mother's Day came up and we had, and all of a sudden we were having social gatherings because they were family and we hadn't really gotten to the point, you know, three guys under the hood of a car in one of my neighborhoods. And they said, I said, okay, you guys can hang out together because you're a little household, little cohort, but don't let a fourth person come into your cohort, work under the hood of the car with you. Because again, it was understanding where people, what they, you know, could, I really say have interaction with. So they could ask you those questions. Is it okay? You know, we, we got it. We, we make money working on cars on the weekends. You know, this is how we do it. You know, um, we had to really change up some of our language about that. But I, you know, I, I think even the mailing the test kits to the home, I think it really does require that door to door, you know, um, and again, delivering it to people so they can ask you a question about what does this test do? Well, how does it work? Is it hard? Um, I think people are pretty smart. They've been able, you know, I mean, they just need the tools and I think they need to be able to be engaged. And I think that's where our faith base did a lot of work on the social media chats. I mean, we had webinars. We, and again, going door to door was a huge hit. You know, I'm going to say for us to continue to go door to door, and they'd say, "Hey, I saw you before in my neighborhood. Here's, I want to ask you a question." You know, um, and I think that becomes taking of where people are at is extremely important. So, Sandy, related to that, another question just came in that is near and dear to us at Health and Medicine too. Um, the door-to-door -door method suggests a need for massive investment in community health workers for COVID and other diseases. And not everybody uses the term uh, community health worker, but we all know what those professions are. How could that contribute to uh, better public health? I think we've seen evidence base on so many programming um, about how we can improve health outcomes in our most vulnerable communities through the use of community health workers. Um, and I, I think we were, you know, again, we, I'll be honest, I would like to say that they were all from the community at times, but oftentimes it was someone that didn't look like them, but it was the engagement. You, I, I, I wanna to talk to people about even that piece of it. Many people were isolating their homes and had not seen another human being. And one person said, can I just talk to you? <laughs> You know, as they, we were sitting on the porch, you know, our six feet away, mask on, and really wanted to see another human being outside of the people that they were with. Um, and again, understanding that there was opportunity to talk about other things. You know, they might have asked you about, you know, and we, we were really to really working and to Dr. Smith's point to encourage our patients to get in for their routine medical care that our FQHCs here had made their environment safe for them that they shouldn't worry about coming into the clinic if they needed their routine checkup. Many people ask us about medicine where, you know, I need my refill done. How do I do that? And I think we forget how important that connection is with another human being. And those community health workers, if we standardize and you know professionalize it in the sense of making it a part of our care routinely, it's a definite asset. I mean, I think that we would have improved the vaccination rates throughout many of our communities. I wanna thank Dr. Smith, who has to sign off just a couple of minutes early. We really appreciate all of your contributions to this conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. So I have one last question. I think we just have a couple minutes. Let me ask the two of you. So what do we, and this is an easy one. Um, what do we do about the community areas where there's still a large number of people who are not vaccinated? How do we let people know it's not over yet? Much as people would like it to be over yet, I think we're all pretty weary, but it isn't, it isn't done. So any thoughts about messaging and communicating that no, it's not over and we need you to get vaccinated. We need you to do your part. Yeah, people who aren't vaccinated at this point, they need that um, interpersonal, that one-on-one -on -one sort of conversation. Those are not folks who are going to respond to a public service message. Those are not folks who are going to respond because we're not talking to them. We're not hearing them. We have to, those are one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
understanding what is their hesitancy or why they haven't gone there yet. And that's really needed, um, really um, door to door, as Sandy talked about, uh, even in big urban areas, it's, it's meeting people and, and understanding what their concerns are and addressing them honestly. And I also say for all of us, healthcare providers and never miss an opportunity, never miss that opportunity to engage them. And I think that was part of the other challenge of this vaccine. You know, we started out with these, you know, I'm going to be honest, logistical challenges with very fragile vaccines and storage. And, and initially you couldn't waste a dose, right? I mean, we were like, oh my gosh, it was, you know, you'd see advertisement, one dose left. You know, now I hear providers kind of saying the same thing. And I have to say, even if you take one dose out of that vial and that person's ready and you had that conversation, they were in for something else, give it. Um, you know, they're ready. And oftentimes it's almost, I'm going to say it's that, you know, in personal engagement that says, you know, address the hesitancy. But we're oftentimes we, we're finding people say, well, I just was waiting. I'm not sure what, you know. What we're not waiting so what for. they were waiting for, but they but were waiting. They were waiting. And so, you know, that I'm waiting for you. So come on in. Um, and I think that the greater challenge is, you know, we, we also know that the vaccine schedules have changed. I mean, just to make it a little more complicated. Do you need three or four? Did you get a Johnson or Janssen first? And so, you know, again, handling that with sensitivity and care. Um, and, and I think there was someone else I saw in the chat box that talked about they were fully vaccinated and up to date boosted and had COVID, right? And so I think as healthcare providers, we have to be comfortable that our endpoint on this was not that it would prevent all cases of COVID, but it was going to prevent serious illness. And so, you know, and yes, we might have that small percentage that may have ended up hospitalized. But again, our end point was to reduce those that had serious illness requiring hospitalization and potentially, you know, leading to death. We really wanted to prevent that. Well, I think we could go on for a couple more hours, but it is 5.30 and uh, we promised to end this at 5.30. So um, I want to thank Dr. Martell, Dr. Fegan for this wonderful conversation. And this has been recorded. So if any, if uh, folks know people who would like to listen to it. We will have it available on our on the health and medicine website. Marty, I just want to remind people about one of the comments in in, in that uh, the, the United States' next responsibility is to get this vaccine around the world. Right. It, it, the virus will continue to cycle and, and travel, and even if we have great vaccination rates in the U.S., which we don't, uh, we still need to make it available to other countries, especially now that we have the opportunity for a vaccine that is uh, more easily um, transportable, doesn't require that deep freeze that we were requiring before yeah. um, resources. And I, I think you put it well, and it's, you know, we're not all safe till everyone's safe. That's, that's so true. So thank you all very much for participating in this. Um, stay tuned for more information about health and medicine forums coming up. This is the first of our nine part series, so you'll be invited to others. Thank you and have a wonderful evening and be safe, everybody.